and I attend University of Texas at El Paso. And my name is Beth Rodriguez, and I attend the University of Texas at El Paso. Um, I'm Alexander Quesada. Um, I attend Lima, Lima College from the City University of New York. Uh, I'm Shikha Rao. I attend Gitsilani Hyderabad campus. Cool. Cool. Well, a quick introduction. Um, so, uh, for our REU here at uh, Lawrence Tech, we are developing, analyzing, and evaluating self drive algorithms using real street legal electric vehicles in real time on a predefined environment based on line following and lane centering algorithms. So, a uh, short and sweet, that is uh, what we're doing here today. So, moving on to the novelty, uh, we develop the lane following algorithms that uh, operate under all kinds of weather conditions on the on the line, all kinds of weather conditions. algorithms on a real self-driving electric vehicle and we also combined the contour block detection and hotline methods to develop an algorithm for lane following. Cool. Um, the testing equipment we did use uh, was first of all the modified Polaris oh, sorry about that. Uh, modified Polaris Gem 2, uh, max speed of 20 miles per hour and also a range of 20 miles. Um, it's a sponsored uh, data speed uh, drive-by-wire system at turn radius of 150 inches uh, width of uh, about 405 feet and a length of eight, eight, and, a, eight and a half feet, sorry. Um, and also a Mako G319 camera. Uh, most important part about this, uh, ROS integration, uh, a resolution of 2064 by 1544, and uh, a max frame per second at 37 frames. Um, that's the environment that we're using. That's parking lot edge here at the LDU University campus. Okay, so now for our code architecture. So um, it is worth noting that uh, we we printed this uh, RQT graph from the frost bag. So instead of connecting to the frost bag, this will be connected to the uh, drive-by wire system on uh, installed on the Polaris Gen 2 vehicle. So um, our color architecture works by, um, so we have uh, several nodes here. Um, so uh, this line follow node uh, is called the same, uh, is the same uh, structure for all three algorithms. Uh, so the line follow node uh, does one thing only. Uh, it takes the camera image, it checks where the lane lines is, and based on that, it computes a yaw phrase so the vehicle knows uh, uh, where, where to turn and then it publishes that to the control unit. Uh, the control unit uh, handles all the vehicle uh, speed and turning. It's like the one node that controls uh, uh, the movements of the vehicle. It can decide whether or not to accept uh, the yaw rate uh, values from this node based on, uh, based on uh, other messages it gets from the other nodes. So, um, then here we have the yellow line node. All this node does is uh, it, try, it detects this yellow line over here, and it does that um, actually by uh, taking the camera image and getting like a, a specific region where you will only see like just part of the yellow line, like around there, like a, in that rectangle. Um, so uh, it does that by uh, first it converts the image to a HLS image, which stands for uh, hue, saturation, and light values, and we pass it like uh, we pass the parameters specifically for yellow. This parameter can vary uh, depending on the lighting condition. So if it's very sunny, we might have to uh, increase the saturation uh, in the light. But if it's overcast, we need to we we have to put like very low values. So we have to play with that depending on the lighting conditions outside. Uh, and like uh, once once it sees the yellow line, uh, it doesn't like uh, send a message right away to the control unit. It, it first waits. Uh, uh, it, it actually first uh, takes like uh, the contour of the largest the, the contours of yellow pixels. So like the number of yellow pixels in the frame it sees in the uh, region of interest. Uh, uh, if it sees like a uh, above six, if, if it, it computes the area of yellow pixels, the number of yellow pixels it sees, and if it sees more than 600 yellow pixels for seven consecutive frames, then it say, okay, that's the yellow line, and we will send a message that I saw the yellow line to the control unit, and the control unit uh, 
close after the yellow line in parking lot H, we have to make a depth reckoning turn. So um, we have like an algorithm to uh, automatically do the turn since we cannot see the yellow line. Uh, it's a pre program. Uh, we have one more node uh, that actually is very important. We call it the SDT report, and SDT stands for speed, distance, and time. Um, all that node does is keep track of the time, the big is in motion, the distance it has traveled, uh, and the speed is going. Uh, so, the, uh, this, uh, so the yellow line actually uh, takes the time from the SDT report to um, count, because uh, we have to like adjust uh, some parameters, because when you would make the depth reckoning turn like this. Uh, so if we go back to the uh, uh, parking lot H, uh, so that would be over here. So like uh, around here, so if it's making this depth reckoning turn, right? When you would make it, you would see this other yellow line and we interfere with the yellow line detection. So like what I did was like I put a, 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 30, a 30 second scroll down, like when it's making this turn here to not look at other yellow lines until the 30 seconds pass and then so it will keep looping. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, and once uh, once you see the yellow line, you will drive up to the yellow line, stop for three seconds, and then continue doing the depth reckoning turn. And like and like that, it will look. Um, and then uh, it will let the uh, let the, con the control unit do this will handle the doing the depth reckoning turn. So all these nodes are communicating with each other. Uh, that's that for the call architecture. Okay, so moving on to the filters and the ROI, due to the difficult course and lighting conditions that we were faced, uh, we were faced with a cluttered image. Uh, cluttered and noisy image that made it difficult to detect the lane lines. Uh, so the colors that we were interested in looking at were white and yellow. We did this by uh, converting the image to an HLS color space to select only these colors and uh, combine them into a mask. After filtering, we were left with an image that contained only either white or yellow. However, however the image remained very noisy. So this problem was minimized as much as possible through the implementation and the modification of OPCV functions such as CANI, range and a custom adjustable white balancing filter. Uh, in addition to filters, we applied a region of interest, which was uh, added to the image to crop out any unnecessary visual information. This was done through the utilization of a NumPy array with five points that was used to plot a polygonal mass uh, to boost efficiency. And one important thing to note was that this ROI was different for each algorithm based on uh, the area that we wanted to focus on. And then here you can see the ROI being plotted in here if you have polygonal mask that gives us this image right here, but as you can see, there's very little noise. And over here we have our detection for yellow, which uh, as Alexander was explaining before, just detects yellow and does our depth reckoning turn. And for algorithm one, we called it our blob slash shifted line following algorithm. And this algorithm was the simplest, but ultimately it allowed us to familiarize ourselves with the environment and the challenges that would be present over the course of testing. So this algorithm utilizes a proportional turn rate that is calculated by finding the centroid of the largest contour uh, that's generated from lane lines at the center of the camera in ROI and then functions from the OpenCV library. Through rigorous testing, we found that although this algorithm is reliable uh, with smooth curves at low speeds, once the speed increases and the, sh and the curve gets sharper, the, the accuracy of this algorithm decreases. So this algorithm was ultimately used as a base for our other two algorithms. And here you can see some images of simulation. And you can see uh, the differences in, in the detection of the lane lines based on the noise and the, the overall quality of the image. So here in simulation, it's almost perfect because there's no disturbance. But in real, real, life, in real life testing, you can see that the lane line isn't great and that's because of the saturation of, of Our second algorithm uses half lines for line detection, and it also uses a combination of contour for some of them. So we experimented with like four different combinations of algorithms um, with line detection and lane centering, and we ultimately found that half lines followed by contour detection worked the best. And uh, for lane centering, offsetting the um, offsetting the half lines worked the best. It worked much better than averaging the center middle lane line and then uh, going off of that. And um, we tested them in simulation and in real-time environment. And in simulation as well as in real life, the last algorithm is the one that worked the best. 
Um, it, it works really, even though it jitters in simulation at higher speeds, it does not jitter in real life and works uh, really smoothly in, um, when testing it on the actual course. And um, this is an example of the average center lane line uh, lane centering method with half lines. And this does not use um, this does not use the blob detection on the center lane line. Instead, it uses the second coordinate. So when we plot a line, we use two coordinates. So it uses the second coordinate, the one at the top, and it takes the x coordinate from that, and it automatically calculates the yaw rate from that. So that's what is being used here. And over here, this is the one that's actually working in real life in our uh, on our vehicle. That's the second algorithm that we've been testing. That plots a half line and offsets it, and then does um, contrary detection on top of that. And this was working really smoothly. Um, it was going at a really high speed to um, of about 6.7 miles per hour. Um, um, yeah, the next algorithm that we have is the spring uh, lane following. This is based off of Professor Nick Paul's um, spring-based uh, algorithm. That was written in C++. This is implemented in Python. and we also made it a little faster so that it's able to follow at um, it's able to follow the lane at 20 frames per second, and um, uh, it uses the spring. It's based off of spring force and it's uh, uh, generating a bunch of rays to push the car to the center of the lane. So that's how it's working. And we also realized out of all of the three algorithms, um, the turns like based on the course. In the course environment, we realized that some of the turns were harder than the others. So for half lines, when it was going on the outer lane, um, the turn three, the turn over here, turned out to be the hardest. Whereas when we were detecting, when we were um, using the blob, uh, blob algorithm, and when we were going in the inner course, the turn two, the turn over here, that turned out to be the hardest. So we realized that um, for different algorithms, different locations on the track were more difficult than others. And um, Um, so this is um, evaluating the, um, the fastest, the smooth, the smoothest, the most reliable um, algorithm of, out of all of them. So um, we, uh, after intense testing, the algorithm that managed to uh, re reliably almost work most of the time as long as the, the weather conditions were playing nice with us was um, offline. So, um, Offlines, uh, we actually got it to make two full laps at um, 6.7 uh, miles per hour, um, which was um, very sur uh, very surprising to us. Uh, so this algorithm um, uh, is sort of uh, uh, introduces like uh, the novelty uh, to this paper. Uh, uh, we we consider it like a, a a minor improvement because we are combining blood detection and offline together to form this algorithm. So we're building on what we had before. We're adding half lines to it. And it makes up for the weaknesses that a plain block detection does. Because uh, with plain block detection, since the lane lines are now are not the smoothest, are now are not connected, are kind of broken up, uh, that interferes a lot with the uh, with block detection because uh, the center of the block is uh, is always changing so they are so uh, the peak is always turning rapidly, which makes it, uh, for a, is, which makes we, which makes the peak a little jerky. But with half lines, since we're looking for uh, a specific slopes, um, we we're always looking for this one line, and that one line uh, it doesn't move; it's it's stable most of the time, uh, and that's why like even at high speed, uh, you only you only it's only looking for one line, and then uh, it's trying like a. a Another line which we call uh, fictitious based on uh, how Dr. DeRose calls it, uh, and we have the algorithm follow that middle line, uh, and and because that middle line is like being uh, artificially drawn to the screen, the color is uh, is always the same, so the blob detection works really well on it, and that's why the algorithm is able to so smoothly uh, work, even at faster speeds. Uh, of course, given the lighting conditions are are good. Uh, it was also the fastest, the smooth thing, the overall best algorithm for us for both inner and outer. Um, so th these are during the official runs. Um, these are the successes that we had, and.
the weather conditions varied a lot during the same time. Um, it was overcast sometimes, rainy sometimes, sunny sometimes. So even with all of these uh, weather conditions, we were still able to have successes with all three of the algorithms that we implemented. And um, there were a few errors, but we realized that the Hoff did not have many um, errors at all. So we, that's how we concluded that Hoff was the best algorithm for uh, out of all of them because there aren't any line touches or lane departures. But there are still a few of the errors. It's still not a perfect algorithm, and of course, it can be improved. But um, it it's much better than the blob and the spring algorithm that we were doing. One more thing that we noticed that was that spring algorithm was working much better for the inner lane of the course rather than the outer lane. Um, in the outer lane, it was having a lot of um, lane departures and there were infinite number of lane touches and um, lane touches. But uh, for spring in the inner, there were um, there were no errors and it was also really smooth and um, we, we think that it could go at a much higher speed as well. Then fails during the official run. We had two failures. Um, the reasons for the failures was that um, so, so the half line failed on the outer course. Um, the reason for the failure was that it was going at a very high speed then, and the sunlight suddenly changed from uh, sunny. Uh, it suddenly changed from overcast to sunny, and um, the camera couldn't adjust fast enough, so it lost it at one of the turns. And for spring, um, the reason that it um, the reason that it failed during the outer lane was because of the dead reckon was because of the dead reckon uh, term. And well, now I'd like to <clears throat> I'd like to discuss some uh, environmental challenges first. Uh, what we faced out there during our official uh, test runs. So first one is you can see up here at the top left is going to be uh, broken or um, like dirt patches on our actual lane lines. This would uh, break up our tracking uh, for our lane lines. Uh, this would make it very inconsistent. A quick. Uh, solution that Dr. Chung actually came up for us uh, with us would be the uh, strip of reflective white tape we would place along securing and along the dirt patches or broken lines. This would allow us to keep a more consistent and uh, brighter white line. Um, the one that we didn't expect to happen to us exactly would be on official test day. It was uh, overcast and then it turned into downpour on rain. Uh, this caused two problems. The first one being, as you can see in this picture, reflective ground. Uh, the puddles would leave us with uh, the reflection of the white clouds above, uh, messing up our white blob detection and our lane uh, the tracking. Another one was the consistent uh, constant downpour onto a windshield, which obviously would uh, mess with the camera uh, uh, behind the windshield. And then another challenge was the tree. Uh, near the course, this would leave a big blob of uh, shadow, and this the, the drastic light change between uh, like bright light, bright white to uh, the dim light would uh, not allow the camera to pick up the lane lines. Uh, solution for that, uh, for us, we use dynamic reconfiguration with our HLS uh, values. We adjusted light. We would uh, while during the run, we adjust it through dynamic reconfiguration. And then last, well, not lastly, but uh, the, the one on the far. Uh, right corner, we have the yellow parking lane lines near our uh, white lane lines. Uh, this would uh, interfere with our yellow detect. This would cause premature uh, stoppage of the course because uh, the camera would pick up the yellow lane lines and uh, think it was going for the hard wrecking right turn. Our solution for that, we developed an ROI and are able to crop the image so that it wouldn't see anything outside of our lane lines. And then one last one that is not on here. At the beginning of one of the courses, we had two white lines on the side uh, on the beginning of an outer uh, test. Uh, we were able to block those with um, um, like objects we found by. That was our quick solution on the official test day. Also, uh, challenges that aren't labeled here that aren't environmental, but they were uh, coding actually uh, challenges software is uh, simulation versus actual uh, in real life testing uh, simulation. Uh, everything symmetrical, as you can see back in the courses, if you can remember it. Um, there is a symmetrical circle. Yeah, you can bring it back. Cool. As you can see, on uh, this is uh, like our simulation. Everything's symmetrical. Everything's even. Uh, no issues there. So our programs, our algorithms, would run perfectly at high speeds in a simulation. But when we brought them out to the actual course, as you can see, the environmental challenges that I just discussed uh, interfered with the performance. So it was kind of a Yes, it would work in simulation, and we have to go out to test it, and then we have to change up all our values all over again. Cool. Yeah, um, so now for the best and worst human drivers. Uh, so um, for the most part, um, uh, the human 
drivers um, managed to somewhat keep uh, within the speed limits, but we did have like uh, major speed violations. So, and also like it's it's not um, it's not as, uh, it's not very consistent. Uh, a mysterious driver over here, or went quite fast, um, uh, almost uh, 15 miles per hour. So um, uh, definitely over our speed limit. And then um, next slide, please. Uh, you know, when we compare it to the algorithm, it's, it's much more consistent. For as you can see, it's like there are much many more uh, lines because of uh, it's doing it like a, almost um, uh, it's doing very very fast. Um, minor if it adds very minor adjustment, it does it very fast. So like there is much more like shredded, uh, but it's also more consistent. In, uh, we don't have uh, uh, any speed violations because. Um, most of the algorithm could not go that fast to begin with. Uh, uh, the help line was the only one which uh, managed to go to uh, seven miles per hour, but uh, unfortunately I forgot to report back for that one, and I don't have uh, like a graph to show here. Uh, just to recap, we proposed and implemented three different lane following algorithms uh, using computer vision and testing them on an electrical vehicle in a control test environment. And the real testing uh, environment had sharp curves, poor road conditions, unclear, and uh, narrow lane markings, and dynamic light conditions with it, which did mess with the detection of lane lines. We evaluated human driving and the algorithms for self driving vehicles using a custom performance uh, evaluation function. And we analyzed this and compared them to, to come up with our data. And ultimately, our most reliable algorithm overall ended up being our hop line implementation. Thank you. So oh, actually, uh, lastly, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Chung, uh, Dr. Rose, Dr. Uh, Siegel, Joe, Mark, uh, Professor Nick Paul. Thank you all for like, this opportunity through this REU. Uh, we've all, I believe, we agree that we've learned a lot. Yeah. And um, we're very grateful. Thank you.